Hey, welcome back to Garberty. It's good to see you again. Hope you guys are all doing well. As you do know, I am getting hit with a lot of uh, limited on my videos for some unknown and strange reason that we also all know why. So, unfortunately, uh, and you guys are telling me to do this, uh, I would highly, uh, highly enjoy it if you guys would donate to the coffee and help keep the channel going. It's fucking ridiculous. I have to do this and even bring it up in the beginning of a video. It feels like begging, but I guess that's just the way things are nowadays now, ain't it? Also, be sure to stop by the Red Bubble. Now, get any stickers if you want them. They are quite cheap because I made them that way. Stop by Commando Blog for some good blogs. Stop by Fire Force Ventures for some nice, nice brushstroke camo pants. And be sure to stop by the Discord and say hi. I'm trying to be a little more active on there than I am anywhere else. But without further ado, let's get on to the next chapter. Chapter 13 When Yule awoke the next morning and stepped out onto the parade grounds with his cup of tea, he was startled to find it packed from top to bottom with veil folk. So much, in fact, that Yule had to turn some of the veil folk away in order to keep Valhalla Hill staffed. He found no disparagement from the races, as it seemed the volunteers were a healthy mixture of elves, dwarves, oni, and brim-touched, all wearing their uniforms and holding their dwarf-issued weapons. Standing behind the uniformed auxiliaries were the fresh new boots from the surrounding areas, and they were sorely disappointed when Yule told them they had to be trained up first before they could enter the field. The amount of fresh recruits flowing into Valhalla Hill would require a lot of manpower to train, forcing Yule to pull away his entire First Dragoons and the majority of the Cosmoline Company's human fighters just to drill them. This left Yule with the majority of his fighters being locals. However, these were at least trained to a somewhat standard proficiency in their soldiering, and the veterans of the ambush had tossed in their lot as well. The days before, his offensive push went past swiftly. As everyone was loaded up with provisions for the field and given last-minute instructions on what was to happen if they were shelled, Yule was also leaving behind the vehicles to guard the hill, as he assumed the majority of the fighting would be done stealthily, more than likely crawling up into the wire and getting in as close as possible to avoid getting pounded on the approach into any towns or cities they came across. Four platoons were drawn up from the volunteer auxiliaries and put under command of three veil riders who would act as their platoon sergeants. While these platoons would head out to skirmish and hopefully take care of the artillery, another small company under the command of Domino would head out to see what they could do about Sanrion. Piper, in turn, would take up administrative duties for Valhalla Hill, while the 601st would be out on their own doing their ghost duties in the wilds of the Valleylands. A lot of Coswin Company had issues with sending out Yule on a zone with so many green troopers, some of which only having a few weeks of training under their belt. But Yule was adamant on going out with as few Terran Veil Riders as he could manage. Yule knew full well that the largest wealth of tactical and modern warfare knowledge lay in the humans that walked the veil with him on that first day, and that he needed to keep as many alive as possible training the veil folk. He felt uneasy taking as many as he was out on this particular offensive, and had a mind to make them all stay while heading off on his own with his troopers. The Vale Riders who had given command of the platoons outright told him to go pound sand when he brought it up, and he walked back the idea rather quickly. A small squad of Himalayas also volunteered to accompany Yule, which he took in stride and made them the main scouting element of his platoons. Savras tried to weasel her way into Yule's Himalayan volunteers, but he pinned her with the job of watching over Valhalla Hill, and the two got into multiple shouting matches through the days to him leaving. 
Yeth demanded to go with Yule out into the field as well, but he told her he needed her to stay. He told her that she was needed here, to train more medical personnel with Gruesome, and to make sure nothing hokey happened with the locals while he was gone. She fought viciously against him until he put both hands on her shoulders and leaned in towards her face one night during dinner. There's only a few people who I trust to watch over things here, and one of them is you. If you don't think you're able to manage things here for me while I'm gone, I can find someone else if you so wish. After that, there was no more pushback to be found from Yethus. She did, however, leave him multiple bottles of her blood, just in case he needed to refuel his translation amulet, and left little encouraging notes on the label so Yule would have a morale boost out in the field. Yule didn't think they needed quite so many hearts on them, but the blood indeed would come in handy. His tonka still needed a lot of work, and his Midwestern accent really did butcher the pronunciations. On the final day, Yule and a small company set out from Valhalla Hill and dived hard to the west. Working off the reports from the Himalayans that they saw some weird looking things moving about a small city called Emalone. The first week of travel went by lively, and Yule quickly came to enjoy the bickering that happened around him on the road. His second in command for this offensive was Mullen, a rather blasé man from South Dakota that was never easily excited. He was shorter than Yule, with mousy brown hair, brown eyes, and a sprinkling of brown freckles that ran down his nose. Those in the company called him Mousin, which he took with the rise of eye rolls. Between Mullen and Yule, it was more like they were wrangling cats every day, having to make sure the platoons kept their spacing on the road and to make sure the dwarves and Oni didn't hurt themselves in their nightly arm wrestling contests. The Himalayans proved to be not what Yule had hoped. Preferring to ride on the shoulders of the taller Vale folk and lope alongside the formations as they walked, when Yule would task them to go and actually do their job of scouting, they would return back after a few minutes of flight to report they saw nothing, and return to playing around with the platoons or running off with small pieces of equipment. It wasn't until they came across their first enemy picket that everyone understood this was not a morning hike into the woods. Most shocking to Yule was how many small patrols they did meet on their way to him alone. Skirmishes were almost a daily thing in some cases, usually starting with Yule and his platoons coming into contact with the Chosen Children patrol and pushing them back and away or laying in wait for a squad that the Himalayans had spotted during their rounds. Casualties were light during their movements, and those who had fallen in battle were given a small burial in the grave marked with large stones. In a weird ritual, a lot of the fallen would have their patches ripped off and handed to Yule, which he kept in his breast pocket. After two weeks, that pocket was getting slowly fuller and fuller, and weighing even more on his mind. Things weren't always so dreary, though, as in their skirmishes they had come across a small vehicle or two, getting them access to a small fleet of battered Humvees and Gators. These small graces allowed them to carry even more gear with them, and kept the Cosmoline train rolling until they were only a few days away from the city. The stiffest resistance was met here, as Yule's auxiliary platoons now came face to face with a whole other company in a small farming village called Mysterium, which Yule assumed was like a small suburb of Emelone. The skirmishes before they got to Mysterium had primed the platoons to be on alert for anything, as an ambush by the Chosen Children had done a fair bit of damage to one platoon in particular having roughly shaken the green from the minds of a lot of auxiliaries. Yule knew what was happening a few heartbeats after the buildings of the small village suddenly lit up with automatic rifle fire, and a small field of elven wheat to their right began popping with the staccato rhythm of machine guns. His platoons had been spread out and moving across open ground, with their only cover being tall grass and a few scattered bushes when the gunfire erupted as it was the only path to the buildings ahead. 
and the chosen children inside the village had waited until they were fully inside their firing lanes. Yule spun his head left and right, standing straight up while the rest of his men and women dove into the tall grass for cover. Bullets snapped and hissed by his head as he looked around, and he saw no obvious alleys of escape from where they were pinned, leaving him with the same choices as that first ambush long ago for the armored vehicles. Push through, stay and return fire, or flee. Yule didn't feel much like fleeing, as they would probably just be cut down as they all stood to run, or tried to crawl away in the grass. Crawling would keep the gunfire at bay, but then they could just lob grenades at them and shell them into oblivion. Trying to stay here and return fire had the same issues, as they would be in the open and ripe for the artillery to pour down on them. He bet that he would have to get in close and grab their belt buckles so they wouldn't be able to rip his platoons apart with artillery fire, and he spun around to face his troopers laying in the grass. Mullen, Yule barked, and he knelt down near a small cluster of brush, pulling out smoke grenades that were hung loosely on his chest. Mullen got up and barreled towards Yule at a low run, tracer rounds cracking around them both as they knelt down in a small huddle. Around them, the auxiliaries were returning fire as best as they could, popping off shots whenever they thought they could tell a flash in the windows of a building or through the stalks of wheat. A brim-touched MG3 team, having looted the machine gun after an ambush, was spraying rounds wildly back at the village, splattering wood and glass from windows or tracing lines of holes down walls. The brim touch holding the MG3 on her shoulder like Yule had taught her was grinning madly as they both traced a barrel back and forth. What's up, Yule? Mullen asked calmly, and he pushed the bill of his patrol cap up. A bullet clipped the brim of his cap and sent it spinning off his head to land on the ground beside him. Mullen made an annoyed sound and reached down to grab his now hold head cover and plopped it back onto his head. To the rear, the vehicles were doing their best to open up with their gunners, the drivers trying to surge forward and put pressure on the village. After just a few seconds, the passengers began diving out of hurriedly flung open doors into cover, machine gun rounds pelting and pinging off the lightly armored Humvees, shattering glass and sending sparks of metal spinning into the air. We gotta smoke our way out of here and push into that village. Yule gestured with a bladed hand at the buildings ahead of him as a pair of bullets ripped through his rucksack. We'll get in close and take them at the boot tip so they can't shell us. Tell the lads to throw smoke at that field and follow my own smoke in. Mullen nodded and scurried off back towards the rest of the troops down the field, who were doing their best to suppress whatever the hell was shooting at them and pinning them down. Yule pulled out his first smoke grenade and pulled the pin tossing it straight down at his feet so he could stand up straight. Purple smoke poured out around his feet and he grimaced. Fucking really? Now fully standing under the cover of the smoke, he pulled the pin on another grenade and threw it ten yards away, waiting for its smoke to furl up before running over to that spot and pulling another grenade's pin. He repeated this for five grenades and created a lane of advance through the open field towards the buildings under the cover of white, purple, amber, red, and even orange smoke. Thankfully, the wind was in their favor and dragging the smoke across the entire ambush lane and should do the job of covering their advance. Yule was coughing hard when he emerged near the edge of the first building and had to cover his mouth to deafen the noise when a home loomed ahead of him. He dove down near a small garden that lay around ten feet away from the house and he peered out from the smoky haze. Before him was a window with shadows moving around inside and he had just enough time to roll to the left and out of the way before the barrel of an M249 poked out and began spitting lead and death at the figures crawling along in the grass. Yule fussed with his battle vest while the gunfire cracked above him, filling his ears with even more tinnitus than he really needed, until he found the fragmentation grenade that was tucked into its corresponding pocket. He pulled the pin on the little ball of death and chucked it into the room lazily, the spoon clinging off the sill and tumbling into the grass. Kobe. 
Yule muttered and watched the window. With their attention on firing through the smoke, the elves inside never really saw the grenade thunk down onto the ground beside them, and had only a few more seconds of life to enjoy before it detonated, throwing its payload around the room. Shrapnel churned through flesh and a dust cloud swallowed the room, sending the small cluster of elves splattering all over the walls and floor. The small cloud puffed out of the window wetly, mingling with the aerosol blood and giving it a slightly red tint. To be fair, the ten elves who had packed themselves into the small living space of the house never assumed that some crazy bastard would just run at them through smoke and lob a death ball into their midst. But that lack of planning was now why they were missed themselves. With the machine gun silenced, the platoons of the Auxiliary Corps funneled into the village through the smoke and poured into the houses and roadways, engaging the chosen children in close quarter battle or extremely close range gunfights. Yule stood up and trailed behind his rushing troopers, coughing and hacking violently at the smoke that was in his lungs. He rounded the corner of the now meat-strewn home and saw that in the center of the village was a small cluster of taller buildings, one of which sported multiple antennas that stabbed up into the sky. He brought up his daywoo and began firing rounds randomly at the windows, shattering the glass and just making sure that if anyone was behind them, their heads would certainly be down and not shooting at his troopers. As he walked and dropped his empty magazine, he looked around. Near the center of the village, which was quickly filling with bodies, dwarves had pulled out pistols and hand axes to start engaging a small squad of chosen that were trying to pour out of what he assumed to be a traveler's inn. The dwarves allowed them to exit the doorway before falling upon them their axes hewing at the legs and joints of their taller foes. And when the elves fell to their crippled knees, the dwarves would then point their pistols at their heads and administer a coup de grace, spattering their brain matter over the stones of the road. The brim touched and Oni saw it more fitting to just use their rifles, beating down and bayoneting any elf that was stupid enough to try and do the same to them. The Valley Elves took it to a more personal level, and Yule could spy multiple short sword and knife fights whirling across the battle space, the Elves nothing but blurs of movement. Yule watched in fascination as a huge Oni Man lifted a shrieking chosen elf above his head, then impale him on a stout center horn. The southern elf screamed in agony as the horn split into his stomach, and bright red blood washed down the face of the Oni in his uniform. The Oni tossed a fatally wounded elf to the ground, then looked at Yule, who was giving him an appreciative look and a thumbs up. The Oni just chuckled and ran off to find someone else to kill. The ambushers from the wheat field were now filtering into the village proper engaging the now scattered platoons in sporadic fighting. Mullen grabbed some elements and directed them to the right flank to deal with these new issues, and the fighting grew with further intensity. Grenades cooked off here and there as Yule slammed another magazine home, and he looked around for Mullen as a small group of Valley Elf auxiliaries ran by with medical bags. Yule ran after them, firing over their shoulders at rifles that were pointing out of the upper floors of the inn buildings. Ahead of them, open fighting boiled in the streets as both forces mingled and danced with the devil, with both parties firing back and forth over the heads of the bloody melee. Vale Rider auxiliaries took cover behind garden walls or sheds to fire at the shooters who leaned out of windows or scrambled along roofs, all the while those in between took to it with knuckles and blade. Yule ducked as a rifle butt came swinging his way, causing him to jerk his rifle the wrong way to deal with the sudden threat. He deftly pulled out his M9 with a left-handed cross draw, having to grab it and spin it around mid-air to get it into his hand, before pulling the trigger and riddling the chest of a southern elf with bullet holes. A short sword bounced off of his right shoulder and Yule bellowed. Swinging around to blast another southern elf in the face, his deltoid stinging and hot with wet blood. 
He spun around and saw that there was no longer a front line, let alone a zone of control. In the village was now a chaotic swirling melee with pockets of gunfire erupting everywhere he looked. While he had achieved the goal of getting in close, shit was getting downright medieval at this point. Son of a bitch! Yule howled, and he slung his rifle over his wounded shoulder with a hiss. Bodies were blurring all around him as control spiraled out of order, and he saw one of his valley elves get thrown to the ground out of the corner of his eye, a southern elf raising his weapon to brain the auxiliary on the ground as if his rifle were a baseball bat. Yule rushed forward and shoulder checked the elf in the chest, causing Yule to roar in pain as his sword wound screamed, more blood pulsing out and oozing down his sleeve. The elf toppled over, and Yule pumped him with his M9 until the slide locked back, only then reaching down to help the valley elf back up to her feet. 9mm brass tinkled down her chest and stomach as she shook herself, and she thanked Yule before picking up her rifle and going to rush ahead. Ah, hold it, you, Yule said, and grabbed the back of her uniform top with his bloody right hand dragging her backwards and throwing her towards the gun line of troopers that were behind a low wall. Get in order. I said get in order. Yule dropped his empty pistol magazine while getting another one out with difficulty, turning on his boot heels and shouting at the auxiliaries running around him. Fall back and use your damn rifles. Quit dueling in the middle of the AO. Fall back, damn you. Hey, you, come here. Yule grabbed a brim touch trying to sneak by him with his short sword out and flashing in the sun, getting a grip on his horns and throwing him back towards a now slowly forming gun line. Fall in, my little bastard children, fall in! Yule turned and rammed the magazine into his M9, the force causing the slide to slam forward on its own, and he fired rapidly into a group of charging southern elves. The ones who didn't fall to Yule were quickly gunned down by his auxiliaries, who were now getting their senses back and forming into ranks, remembering their training. Where the fuck is Mullen? Mullen! Yule yelled, and ducked behind what looked like the remains of a wagon. Unfortunately for Yule, he didn't have much of a chance to really look around for Mullen. Yule looked up and blinked at a curious noise that was getting past the ringing in his ears and saw a Himalayan harpy flying overhead. At first, he was there, flapping his wings and dropping something down onto the roof of the antenna-adorned building. In the next second, there was nothing but a spray of blood and feathers. A heartbeat after the harpy poofed into a cloud of bloody feathers, he felt the ground rumble under his feet and saw a huge plume of dirt cascade into the sky from the far side of the village. Yule heard the keening buzz of artillery shrapnel flying through the air, and he dropped his jaw in astonishment. They're walking it towards us, screamed Mullen from behind, and Yule looked over to see the man crouching near the back side of a cottage with a small group of auxiliaries. More artillery shells impacted on the other side of the village and slowly made their way towards the Vale Rider platoons, the huge fountains of dirt and stone seeming to act like the footsteps of a mighty giant. One building was hit directly by one of the artillery rounds and the whole construction just seemed to disintegrate into dust and shattered wood. Then the inn caught two direct hits, and the whole thing blew apart as if a wind god had sneezed on it. Yule got up and dove near a wood pile, covering his head as lumber and body parts rained down onto him from the explosion. When he went to stand and yell at Mullen, someone's leg brained him on the side of the head, and Yule went back down to the ground, dazed. The bone from the broken femur left a gash on his cheek, and he stumbled back to his feet while throwing his rifle back over his shoulder. As he looked around, he saw that already half of his platoons had been decimated. The bodies of broken dwarves, oni, brim-touched, and valley elves laying scattered around in various states of dismemberment. Even more alarming was the amount of dead southern elves that lay on top of them, 
all of those below being viewed as the same target in the eyes of the artillery. Fall back! Fall back, goddammit! Yul roared, and waved his arm to signal them all to retreat, despite the cut and pain. A small squad of dwarves and oni sprinted past, and the oni reached down to grab whatever fallen troopers they could carry, one female oni already having two bleeding valley elves tucked under her arms. The dwarves simply dragged anyone they could snatch, their thick legs pumping with the weight. Yule spied Mullen yelling at the remnants of a platoon to beat feet, a large piece of metal fragmentation embedded in his chest, and his leg bleeding profusely. Despite this, Mullen still seemed calm, and was giving orders to anyone frozen in place out of fear or shock. Mullen! Mullen, you get them the fuck out of here! Yule bellowed, and pointed at him. Mullen looked back at Yule, and his eyes went wide, and began shouting something that Yule couldn't hear and pointing. Yule turned around and realized what Mullen was saying. He was the only one standing where he was. All his auxiliaries had followed his orders and run past him, and the only ones around him were the dead or the dying. Right, let's go. Come on now. Yule said through gritted teeth as he reached down and grabbed a valley elf by his battle harness, shuffling his M9 to his bloodied right hand to holster the weapon. The elf groaned painfully as Yule began to drag him, and more artillery was coming down behind them. Yule heard something zipping awkwardly through the air towards him, and turned in time to see the blur of the shrapnel that punched through the stomach of the elf he was dragging and embed harshly into his left calf muscle. Yule screamed in agony as he went down to his left knee. And the elf gurgled hoarsely before falling over onto his side, blood foaming out of his mouth and nostrils. Yule stumbled once again to his feet, and began to hobble towards Mullen and a small group of his troopers that were running towards him. That's when Yule felt it. The crawl of a spine. The innate sense of knowing when death himself was looking down at you. Time slowed to an aching crawl as Yule knit his brows together and turned his head to look behind him. Dirt and chunks of earth were cascading down from the sky. Buildings and homes were exploding out, being torn apart by the concussion of the artillery detonating within. Most alarming was that the explosion seemed to be racing towards him faster than his men would ever get to him. And Yule pressed his lips together in aggravation. He turned back towards Mullen and said one final phrase before the cottage next to him erupted into flames. Get them home, Mullen. Yule felt his patrol cap lift away from his head and his hair brush past his face. He felt the hot air roll around him as the shell detonated its payload and turned the cottage into stone fragments and splinters. Shrapnel tumbled past his field of vision as he watched Mullen and the auxiliaries slowly open their mouths to yell. Artillery, Yule thought. As his feet began to leave the ground, his body getting caught up in the blast away from the house. Of all the ways to die is to fucking artillery. Yule had another moment to spare, looking down at the fleeing troopers below. It seemed that around half of the force would be able to get away, the vehicles probably too fucked to drive, but not too many of his lads and ladies would have to die like this. A shame really, I had thought we would have time to scatter before they started shelling us. Plan was to push straight through the village and get out of the zone of fire. I assumed that they would shell our approach and follow it out, not start at their fucking end of all things. Yule looked down at his feet and saw that one of his boots had been blown away, exposing the dirty sock underneath, the other's laces trailing in the wind. Underestimated my enemy's willingness to kill the roan in order to get to me, I guess. Bloodthirsty lot, those fey. Literally starting their artillery on their own lines and brought it towards us to ensure our deaths. Ah, oh, well. Shame I didn't get to see Olivara again. 
Time slowly came back into speed, his ears filling with the ringing and the roars of the concussion around him. Yule felt himself get shunted through the air and slammed through the partially remaining wall of an already ruined home. Blackness took Yule as he tumbled through the blasted inner walls, and his ears slowly dulled away the sounds of impacting artillery and the screams of his veil riders. Mullen watched Yule get thrown through the wall, wincing as his chest and leg wounds pained when he tried to rush forward, but he no longer had control of his own movements. The auxiliaries around him grabbed hold of his battle vest and began dragging him away. When he fought, he was hefted over the shoulder of Anoni, and they themselves ran Mullen out of there while the shells rained down around them. The artillery chased them out of the village and back down the field they came from like hounds baying at the heels of foxes, and only stopped when the remnants of the platoons had run past the broken vehicles. They didn't stop running until they were half a mile away from the ruined village, and only then did they stop to regroup and regain their breath. Only 35% of the small company was battle-worthy. The wounded outnumbered the able-bodied to the one. Mullen passed out as soon as they stopped, and the healers had to work hard to keep his soul from passing on to the other plane. With Mullen down, the auxiliaries realized quickly that he was the only Terran left alive. The other seven or so Terran platoon leaders having died either in the battle or during the artillery strike trying to get their platoons out. Leaderless, they came to the only conclusion they could think of and made camp, waiting for Mullen to awake. Yule felt numb, as if he was wrapped in a giant wool blanket of blackness. If this was what dying was like, he certainly had worse, and at least now he couldn't feel any more pain. It was as if he was suspended in a giant dish of black butter, but he didn't open his eyes, just keeping them closed and letting the sensation wash over him. Overall... He thought he did all right. He made the mistake of thinking the Fey, Unseely, Yuin, whatever they were, would fight like humans. Instead, they fought like ant queens, tossing their soldiers ahead into the meat grinder and caring not what happened to them. He was still shocked that they had shelled their own troopers like that. Shit didn't even make sense, as well as being horribly wasteful. He floated into nothingness for what seemed like days, devoid of all senses, except for the very faint thrum of his heart. Sure is taking a long time, Yule thought angrily, and began to ponder if even dying had to be tedious. You're not dying, said a voice from the void, and Yule rolled his closed eyes towards the sound. Sound was a relative term, more like rolled his eyes toward the corner of his brain that the uninvited thought came from. Excuse me, I'm pretty sure my watch is over, got blown up, thrown through a wall, pretty sure a fay is teabagging my forehead right now. You're not going to die, Terran, came the voice again, and Yule was seriously starting to get angry at this point. The frustration became a glimmer of light that he gripped onto, and he felt his body a little more accurately than he had been previously. He could certainly feel something in his calf, anyway. Uh, pardon me, but my number came up. What, is some kind of veil god going to drag me back to the fucking realm of the living? Something like that, echoed out, and he heard the faint noise of tinkling laughter. I swear to fuck, if you bring me back, I will be talking to your manager. This is horrible customer service. More laughter echoed out from the void, and Yule began to feel more and more of his aches and pains. His back hurt. His calf had something in it. His right arm felt like someone was digging in it with a small angry shovel, and his head rang as if he had gotten a left hook from the Pigeon King himself. Slowly, light began to glow from his eyelids, and Yule gave an internal, spiritual sigh as he came to understand what was happening. Oh, this is so lame. 
Eel groaned, and his eyelids shuddered weakly as he opened them, looking up into the bright glow of the moon. Of course, he knew where the moon was, but couldn't see it because someone was standing over him. He gave a pained sigh and weakly pushed some masonry off of his plate carrier, looking up at the woman standing over him. You better be here to finish me off, woman. I'm not in the mood. The woman laughed, and you'll recognize the laughter from just a few moments before. Aw, oh, damn it. You're a god. Get away from me, fucking hell. Yule rolled over with noises of complaint and tried to wiggle his way up into a seated position, leaning against the pieces of cottage roof to help him. The being, the woman, whatever it was, slowly stepped out around him since Yule turned his back to her, and her delicate bare feet stepped gingerly around the broken stone, shingle, and metal to meet Yule's face again. Yule looked like hot ass. His shoulder was still bleeding, a broken rib was poking out of his rib cage, gleaming white in the moonlight, and his face was a bloody mess, framed by dozens of deep cuts and two blackened eyes. He gave a harsh cough and propped his good left arm on the piece of roof, gesturing at her with his hand. <coughs> I will literally pay you to kill me and fuck off. Yul said, coughing a little more and spitting out a glob of blood onto the ground near his bootless foot. The woman was wearing what looked like simple but elegant armor that reminded him a lot of what the Valkyries were supposed to wear. What with the ornate leather and chainmail chest armor, a skirt of armored plates, and shoulder pads of more tooled leather and furs. The furs were dark red and paired quite well with her pale flesh and white hair. She wore it in a very Germanic way, that weird around-the-head braid thing while the rest of the hair fell loosely down her shoulders and back. Yule didn't like the look of the skulls that were embossed everywhere, and was still lost as to why the thing wasn't wearing any shoes. He looked up into her brilliant wide eyes, and weakly gestured with his left hand again. What's up with the no-shoes thing? You run out of money for socks or something? He coughed again and snorted. Being sassy was taking a lot out of him, and he hurt too much to be as angry as he had been the Void. Right now, he just wanted to lay back down and go to sleep or something, or try to wiggle his way back into the Void. It was nice there, and there wasn't some creepy woman staring down at him without any shoes on. I do not like shoes, she said softly, and she smiled at him, squatting down at the knee and sitting back slightly on her heels. Yule rolled his eyes. Yeah, and I don't like wearing condoms, yet I do. He looked around the village and saw that they had continued shelling well after he had been thrown through the cottage wall, but was happy to see far less bodies than he had expected. That, or they had been shelled into more pieces than he could see, which made him chuckle grimly. He coughed a few more times, then looked back over to the woman, who seemed to be watching him intently. Who are you? Yule said flatly, and leaned his head against the roof piece. He had a splitting headache, and even the woman's eyes were bright enough to cause him discomfort. She tilted her head prettily, and reminded him a lot of Yethis. Death? Yule barked out wry laughter, his teeth red and black with dirt and blood. <laughs> what the fuck, lady? You gonna do your job or what? While Yule knew he was being rude, he thought the hard slap to the top of his head was a bit much, and he howled harshly with searing pain as her hand bounced off of his filthy hair. The woman, however, was smiling still, her canines flashing. Such rudeness. Far too rude to die. My husband says you still have work to do. Ow! What the hell, woman? Yule rubbed the top of his bloody, dusty head with his right hand, wincing at his shoulder. Who's your husband? Why is he calling the shots over me? He handles the deaths on your side of the plane that is linked to this one. Many gods of death. But we handle this as a couple for these two places. Linked by the veil. Anchored by blood and fate. She pulled over a large stone with little effort and sat down on it folding her legs neatly over one another. 
Yule set up a little more inside, reaching back onto his webbing to try and find a canteen. He found one, but it had been shot during the ambush and now lay empty. He tossed it over his shoulder and sighed again, more angrily, as it hollowly tinked and tanged off of broken stone. He hung his head while looking up at her slightly. <sighs> Your husband is the Grim? She smiled sweetly at the Terran nickname. I call him my elder flower. Charming, Yule muttered, and wiggled his socked foot. So what's the deal, toots? You got some kind of magical errand you need me to run or something? Some kind of quest I was born to do or whatever they say in the stories? The death god laughed again and flicked Yule hard on the forehead. Yule howled out a, what the fuck, as she continued to laugh. You watch too many cartoons. When your work is done, you may die. Not till then. She held out her hand to him, and Yule looked at it while rubbing at the mark on his forehead. In her hand, she held a tight stack of Veil Rider patches, many of them blood-stained or filthy with earth, but all tied neatly with some kind of string. Yule looked at the stack and brought his eyebrows together, reaching forward with his good left hand to take the stack. How many? Yule said curtly. Running his thumb over the top patch. Sixty-six, she stated, and patted Yule on the shoulder. Your Terrans did not make it. One named Mullen passed briefly into the afterlife, but they brought him back. The others I took. They are well. Worry not. She stood and dusted off her armored skirt as Yule looked down at the stack of patches in his hand, still rubbing his thumb back and forth along the blood-riddled top patch. They died honorably and await you in the halls. They died good deaths. Be proud, bearded Terran. You looked up sharply and locked eyes with the god. Unbeknownst to him, he had done what thousands of Vale folk feared to do, and to lock eyes with the death god more than once was something only known to the most foolhardy or insane. Will you take care of my troopers? Tell them I'm sorry. The death god beamed down at him, smiling all the way to her eyes. Best of care, bearded Terran, she said one last time, before unfurling two huge white wings from her back. Yule hadn't seen any signs of her even having wings, but the sudden burst of movement made him jump, and her takeoff threw dust into the air as she ascended. Yule ducked his head as she lifted away and coughed a few times, hearing her wings thud the air in their movements before he was left in the aching silence. Yule blinked a few times before rubbing at his face, his flesh rasping harshly from the caked dirt and blood. This fucking place, Yule growled, and he slowly got to his feet, leaning heavily on his rifle like a cane. His debut was shattered and broken far beyond repair, and he mourned for it quietly as he looked around. He saw a few yards away what looked like the remains of a healer core medic in their bag, and hobbled towards it. The buttstock of his rifle gave way after a few hobbled steps, and Yule yowled as he went down hard onto the shattered road. He wheezed and began to crawl towards the bag. He felt something poking into his lung from his ribcage, and quite frankly was fed up with the bullshit at this point. <laughs> Can't get a fucking break. The short journey felt like an eternity, having to use his good legs and kind of performing an awkward slug crawl towards the bag, but he got the job done. The poor elf that was in charge of the bag had caught a lot of artillery shrapnel to his back and spine, and Yule patted the dead elf's shoulder sadly. Sorry, buddy. The bag had caught a lot of the shrapnel too, shattering the majority of the healing potions and vials that were inside. Thankfully, or unthankfully, the wriggling, living bandit seemed to have soaked up a lot of the liquid and was now bright red with the spilled potions. Yule grimaced and paused for a few seconds in contemplation, then grabbed harshly at the living bandage, spashing it to his lips. Amusingly, the bandage seemed to have a mind to fight him, and Yule had to bite onto it to make it behave and bleed, sucking hungrily at the moisture and potion that was inside of the bandage. It tasted like death, and Yule was pretty sure the elf's blood had gotten onto the bandage as well, 
but he could feel the potion working slightly as his ribs slowly pulled out of his lung. As he drank the bandage dry, he reached in for the other one that was trying to crawl away while pulling the shrapnel piece from his calf. He bit down onto the now dead bandage and yelled muffledly into it as the metal came out wetly from his calf. Then he yanked the other bandage over to his mouth, biting down onto it and sucking at it greedily. After this bandage was sucked dry, he looked for other medical bags around the area, now being able to hobble his way around on his feet. He also found his missing boot and slipped it over his bare sock. After a few minutes of searching, he found a canteen of water and an intact healing potion and sat down on a crumpled chimney to sip it both. The village was a ruin and not a single building except for a doghouse was left standing. It looked like something in Europe during World War II. An entire area laid to waste just to snuff out the enemy. Yule couldn't find any working weapons either, only having his M9 and a boot knife left to his devices. When he had drained the canteen and the health potion, he stretched his back and popped whatever was left of his spine into place. His shoulder was slowly knitting back together, but he thought angrily that there was no hope for the large cut on his face and would probably scar up horribly. He looked up at the moon and stood, following its rise and seeing which way south was. Someone is going to eat my boot knife by the end of this, he murmured, and began to make his way through the rubble and remains of his platoons. And that's the end of this chapter. Uh, nice and long for you guys. Sorry for the delay, but I had to help the wife out. Had to help, had to help the wife out. Had to help the wife out in her business, so I had to take a few days off to do that. But yeah, hope you guys enjoy. If you like this video and others like it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you know when the next chapter is released. Additionally, I'm gonna keep you guys up to date with the whole uh, I don't know YouTube thing. Probably gonna keep fucking trying to stomp me down to fucking drain like a turd for all I know. But uh, I have the coffee. There's it's a, there's a link to it uh, in the description and on the page. The coffee has a monthly subscription thing. So even a dollar will fucking do anything nowadays. I mean, fuck me. World is hard out there for the creative. I'll tell you that much. But I appreciate all of you who watched the video. Especially those of you who actually give to the fucking series it's just super helpful and to all of you who bought patches uh that it, it was a huge a huge thing for me I, it was a fantastic having all your orders they're all stacked up next to me should be going out today and into your hands hopefully here soon except for those who are in canada <laughs> uh yours may take a little while longer because canada but yeah uh thanks for buying patches you know and there's, and there's at least 50 left but uh yeah, until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bro.